Good morning. Good morning. It's glad to be home. Wait, wait, wait. Before you get started, this is the first time the church has been with them since they've been married. So uh, I just want to congratulate you and Samantha. They were married last Saturday. It was absolutely beautiful. Woo woo. <laughs> thank you, thank you. One week in. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah, I heard second week was a tougher one, so. All right, so I'm going to have the honor of reading the first lectionary reading. I'm going to be reading Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 3, and then 6 through 15. There are some interesting names in here, so if I pronounce it wrong, just pretend like I didn't. All right. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Zedekiah had said, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, I am going to give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy my field that is Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel. In the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Ju Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vi vineyards shall again be bought in this land. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. We sure missed you guys. <laughs> All right. The second lectionary reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Here I am. Of course there is great gain and godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains." But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, called and for which you are made. The, goodness confess, the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in, the testimony before, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifest, manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he, will, he who will bring all about all the right time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immor immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal do dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present, there I am. As for those in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or set their hopes 
on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous, and ready to share. Thus storing up their to storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that life that really is life. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. Good morning. The responsive reading today is Psalm 91. It can be found on 810 and 811. We're going to do verses 1 through 6 and then 14 through 16. Those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For the Lord will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence, and will cover you with his pinions. Under the Lord's wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Because they cleave to me in love, I will deliver them. I will protect them because they know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. I will satisfy them with long life and show them my salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. If that song don't give you a little bit of Jesus bumps, then you best be thinking about some things. To know that your sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. Amen to that. All right, for announcements today, we welcome Aaron Penix, who will deliver our message today. We're glad to have him and his family with us. Today is our fifth Sunday offering. You have an envelope in your bulletin. You have a pamphlet talking about the Methodist home. So take some time and read that and make a donation today if you feel led to. Our altar flowers, the flower list has two Sundays in October that are open, the 6th and the 20th. If you know someone that has a birthday, anniversary, or somebody you want to remember on those days, sign up. October activities, beginning tonight through October the 2nd, there is a revival at the Vogel Day United Methodist Church at 7 p.m. October the 6th, our Operation Christmas Child begins. Our shoeboxes will be given out and due back on November the 10th. On October the 6th, the United Methodist Women are going to meet after church to make some blankets for Judy's place, and lunch will be provided. And the men, the men are allowed to hang out with us. We'll teach you how to make a blanket. Yeah. On October the 13th, we'll begin donations for our Thanksgiving food baskets for families in the Johns Creek, Coon Creek, and Bent Branch area. Food or money will be appreciated. On the 20th from 3 to 5 p.m., we have the Snively Chapel Fall Celebration with dinner on the grounds. There's some information about the backpack ministry. If you would want, want to make some donations of food or money, there's a list on the bulletin board in the foyer. Our East Kentucky District Prayer Fellowship this month is the Wortland United Methodist Church in Greenup, Kentucky. Any other announcements? On the band competition, I would say uh, for William and Bruce there, be congratulated for uh, going out on the field and doing that. It takes a, a, a lot of uh, intestinal fortitude for when you're in a 40, 50 member band to go out and compete with uh, two, 300 band members. And uh, they don't only have two or 300 band members, but then they'll uh, set up six microphones across the field in front of their band, and uh, doesn't seem right somehow or another. Makes me want to write a letter, <laughs> and I'm a pretty good letter writer. <laughs> we do want to remember uh, Pastor uh, Larry, a report I got yesterday that he had a, a bit of strep and bronchitis. Is that still the... Yes. He's feeling better this morning, but he felt it would uh, be best to just not bring that here and give that to you. Recovery, but he's, he's doing that. So we welcome uh, 
his son Aaron today, uh, Larry's loss is, is our gain. So we're proud to have Aaron. He's been here before. And uh, congratulate again uh, Adam and Samantha. And Adam, I would say that you will never get more compliance from your spouse than during this week. After this, this week, it's all downhill from that. <laughs> just, just, just so you know. There you go. There you go. So we remember uh, all these prayer requests, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we are so thankful and humbled by the many blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day, and we thank you for that. And we petition you on behalf of these who have been mentioned, this small little faithful church and community, Father, and we come to you and we ask on behalf of all these, some who are suffering with illnesses, uh, even unto death, Father, but we know that you know all those situations. And if it be your will to intervene and, and uh, bring earthly healing to them, we pray that, that that would be so. But if not, we ask that your will be done in those cases. And bless also those who care for them and, and uh, minister to them. And most importantly, that this would be a time that they all would, would grow closer to you and examine their their spiritual life as well as their physical being. For all these, we pray and ask your blessing. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I wish Dad could be here. And uh, I told a couple members here uh, this morning that if Dad would just start living right, He'd probably feel better. Amen. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's all right to laugh in God's house. Is that still okay? And uh, I believe it is. Uh, laughter's good for us, isn't it? And uh, this song God put on my heart uh, just a few days ago. I, I was uh, driving and, and listened to this song uh, called Hold Me, Jesus. And uh, it, it just spoke to my heart in that time. So I uh, I had went home and learned, learned it, and I'm going to try to sing it this morning, so y'all pray for me, and I'll do the best I can. I've never done this one before. Well, sometimes my life just don't make sense at all. When the mountains look so big, my faith just seems so small so hold me Jesus cause I'm shaking like a leaf you have been king of my glory won't you be my prince of peace when I wake up in the night I feel the dark it's so hard Inside my soul, swear there must be blisters in my heart. So hold me, Jesus, cause I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? So hold me, Jesus. Cause I'm shaking like a leaf You have been king of my glory Won't you be my prince of peace Surrender don't come natural to me I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want Than to take what you give that I need I like that Well, I beat my head so many walls and I'm falling yes I'm falling on my knees God please and the Salvation Army band is singing this hymn and your grace it rains so deep makes my resistance seem so thin so hold me Jesus 
I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Oh, hold me, Jesus, because I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Yes, you have been king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Amen. That song spoke to my heart, but that thank God He is our prince, the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He's my Prince of Peace this morning, and bless God, He uh, sends peace in, in troublesome times. And uh, David said, "One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord." He said, "In the time of trouble." He'll hide me in his pavilion, in the secrets of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he shall set me up on a rock. And I just thank God today that I'm saved. I'm on the winning side. Everything's going to be all right. I'm going to heaven when this life's over. Amen. <laughs> beginning the Word of God. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me into the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number uh, 5. Let's go to chapter 16. And uh, I really just have a thought this morning. So, uh, you know, I, I, I usually like to have a sermon prepared, an outline, and everything ready. But this morning that's not the case. And uh, I just want to mind the Lord. And uh, this message is what God gave me last night in my study, and I'll do the best I can. Y'all pray for me. In 1 Samuel 16, the Bible says, And the Lord, when you get there, 
1 Samuel chapter 16. Say amen. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? He says, Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint him to be king whom I named unto thee. We find next that... Uh, Verse 4 says, Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peace, peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice in the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eli, and said, Surely the Lord... Anointed is before him. I love this. And it came to pass when they were come, he says, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, <laughs> I like this, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning, God, that you would revelate our hearts and our minds of what you would have us to say and do this morning. I pray, Father, that uh, God, we, we, as we know that you do not see, Father, uh, God, as I can see, but Lord, you see deep down in the crevice of the heart, Lord, and you know uh, everything that we think, everything that we are, Lord, there's no secret that we can hide from you. There's nothing, God, we can't run away from you. Father, you're everywhere. You're all present, Lord. We thank you. We pray, God, that you would help us this morning. As the prayer's been prayed many times, one more time I come to you, and I ask you, God, to draw each and every one of us closer to you in our walk. And may if there be one here this morning lost, God, I pray they'd get saved before it is too late and heavenly. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. This is the thought that God had placed on my heart this morning. And, and, and as I studied this scripture last night, as, as God doesn't see as man sees, but God looks upon the heart. And I, I thought just real simple, I hope this morning, not to get too complex, but just the thought that let's get our heart right with God. We, we need to get our hearts right with God. And, and probably the most important thing that there is that we could do today is to make sure that our heart is right with God. And um, that, that's easy to say, but it's harder to admit and harder to do. And, and I, in all of this, I, I want to look at, at, at the, the story, I want to look at the situation, and we'll quickly get into the message. But we find here that Saul was the king of, of, of this time. And King Saul had um, done wrong in the sight of God. He disobeyed God's commandments. And God set him up as the first king over Israel. God had done wonders with Saul, and Saul was in, in war his whole life, but, but he had been one to defeat army after army, and God had blessed him. And, and over time we find that God, that Saul had disobeyed God in the commandments of God. And it, it, it repented God that he ever made Saul king. So God took the kingship from Saul and said, I'm going to give it to another man. Who was that? We find in this, in, in this passage of Scripture that this is the process in which God is calling that man, that next one to be the king of Israel. And in the process, he goes to the Samuel uh, there and, and has Samuel uh, go to the uh, house of Jesse and, and pick out of one of his sons a king for the nation of Israel to reign uh, after Saul. And when he gets there, what happens? 
He sees this. He sees this man, uh, or this, the oldest of the brothers, which would be Eli, and Samuel finds that there's seven of the sons of Jesse there, and he chooses looking at the appearance of one who is the oldest, who is the tallest, uh, who is probably the, the greatest looking of them all, and says, that's got to be God's man. Look at him. That's him. And that's when we get to our story, and the Bible says that uh, God, God said, that, that is not the one I have chose, uh, Samuel, because I don't look as, as man seeth on the outer appearance, but, but God looks upon the, the heart of a man. God sees the, the heart and the soul and knows what you're thinking. He knows w what we're doing at this very hour. You can fool a man. You can fool the preacher. You can fool your, 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 your spouse, but you can't fool God. We can't hide from God, can we? He knows, and He knows, and He knows. And so, so uh, God had chosen someone else. And it wasn't the, the tallest, it wasn't the, the best, but it was one that had the heart of God. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And God chose David because of his heart. And, and I think it's important today that if we're going to be used by God, I, 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 God give me this, it's real simple. It's so simple. But, but I believe if we're going to be used by God in, in our service, in our Christian service, it's important that our heart is right with God. I think that's evident. If God's going to use you to the utmost for His kingdom, it's, it's vitally important that the child of God has his heart right with God. And, and that's what we want to get at this morning. I want you to see something here that blessed me. Tremendous as I, as I read this last night. And, and it says here in uh, verse number that Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And so here we go, all of these sons are coming before Samuel. One after one after one. And each one, they say, no, he's not it. All seven of them passed, and God didn't, didn't choose not one of them. What are we going to do? And we find that, that in this text, he said unto Jesse in verse number 11, Are here all the children present? Are they all here? And he says, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, listen to this, send and fetch him. And when I read that, it just jumped off the page at me and blessed my soul last night. Why? Because, you know, he, he, he's, the dad, the father has, has presented all of his sons, all of the eldest, all of the oldest, all of the best that would be more, the most qualified for the job. He's presented them to Samuel. And they're standing there. And then he says, I don't understand this, but God didn't prove any of that. He don't want any of these. They're not it. Do you, do you have another son? Oh, yeah, I've got another son, but he's the youngest. He's out in the field. He's, he's, a, he's just a shepherd boy. He's, 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 not, he, he's, he's, he's not it. And Samuel said, go fetch him. Go fetch him. And it just so happened to be the very one that God wanted to use was David, and, and the, the youngest, the, the one that wasn't the, 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 the tallest, and probably, I believe that Eli probably fit the, the, the description. You know that King Saul was, was taller than any man out of all the Jews. He was a head length taller. They, they would come up to his shoulder, the Bible says. They, 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 this man was taller than anyone in, in Israel. The, the first king was that tall. So I would say that, would you, would you say this, that the... Um, Samuel, as he was picking, he probably thought that they had to look like Saul. He probably thought they had to be a, a tall and, 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 and fit that kind of criteria. And we see that that wasn't the case, that God chose the youngest. And God chose, and, and, and the point of it all, the point of it all is to understand that when your heart is right with God, when you can get your heart in a place that it is right with God, God will use you. It doesn't matter how, how tall, how big you are, how, what your bank account is like, or, or none of those things matter with God. Because, see, God created all of that. 
God's in control of every bit of that. It means nothing to Him. If He needs to get you the finances to do what He's called you to do, He can do that. He's God. He's big enough. If, if He needs to get you the, the strength to, to, to slay this or, or, or go up against the giant, guess what happened in the next chapter? David goes up, and guess who's shaking? Saul, the, 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 the biggest man that's there, a head length over everybody, shaking, won't go up against the giant. But guess who goes up against that giant and kills him? David, the, the youngest, the one that they said, ah, he's not it. But God said, go fetch him. And in the very next chapter, we see David standing up, said, hey, I, God delivered me from the bear, and God delivered me from out of the mouth of that lion. And if God delivered me from all of that, I know that God will deliver me from this Philistine, and this uncircumcised Philistine. And God did so because David had trusted in God. He put his trust. That's why I love that song I sang. All my hope is in Jesus. Because, listen, at the end of the day, nothing else matters but that everything that I've got, every single thing that I've got, it's not in me, it's not in myself, but my hope and my confidence is in somebody that's bigger than I am. Thank God for it today. And His name is Jesus, and all my hope's in Him. And, and real quick, let's look at these things. I'm going to back up into chapter number 15. I want to look at uh, just a few things here in chapter 15. Pray that it will bless you. I pray that it will bring you closer to God in your walk with Him. Uh, the first thing I want to look at, I believe that God gave me this last night, that it isn't a, a, a religion, but rather it is a relationship with Jesus. See that it, it isn't a religion, but it is a relationship with Jesus. It's a personal walk with Him. It, it isn't about ceremony. It isn't about ritual. Let's go back and look in chapter number 15 what the King Saul did that put him in the place he was in. See, in, in chapter 15 we, we do want to understand that Saul was given a command of, of God to go and, and to wipe out the Amalekites and to kill every sheep, every animal, every person because of the great sin they have committed. And, and these people, they, they were um, terrorists. They, they, they remind me very much of uh, Al-Qaeda and or, you know, those people that flew into the World Trade Center. That's the kind of people these Amalekites were. They, they, they were awful terrorists. And, and they were destroying uh, good people and and hurting people. And God said, I want you to go and wipe everything they've got. I want you to take out their sheep. I want you to take out their, their everything. Don't spare one thing. And what happened? King Saul, listen to this, in chapter 15 says um, that when, when Saul pleads for forgiveness, this is telling us what he did wrong. He's, he's finally admitting, this is what I've done. Finally, after lying twice, he pleads to God and says, God, will you help me? And this is what he says. Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy works, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You hear that? Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of God, of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And I want to tell you this morning, it's important that we get our heart right with God, because we find in this text that somebody didn't think that was important, and God rejected them, and they didn't fulfill the purpose that God had for their life. If we are going to fulfill the purpose and walk in the the plan of God for our lives, it is vitally important that we get our heart right with God. I think that's evident. And, and, and we see that Samuel did not do that. Why? Because he feared the people right here. He was afraid of what the people would do to him. If he didn't listen to God, he was afraid of what might happen. And, and it is uh, under this I want to, to pull out the fact that it is a relationship with Jesus, not a religious performance. And, and we see in verse number 13, how that Saul comes uh, to Samuel after all of this is done. He said, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So he, he's trusting in his performance, how good of a job that he did. But let's back up just a couple verses. Let's look at what God said about Samuel. See, Samuel said, I just read to you, Samuel said, 
Blessed be thou the Lord. He, he, or Saul rather looked at Samuel, said, Blessed be thou the Lord, for I have done the performance well. And, and now we're going to look back and see what, what, what uh, God said about that. In verse number 10, they came, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. <laughs> it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, the pre and he cried to the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came. And that is when he meets, he meets this man, this king Saul. And Saul says, I've done what God's told me to do. What is that? That's the outer performance, isn't it? That's the outer part of man. Look, look you know what couldn't happen? Saul uh, knew that, that Samuel couldn't see his heart. You know this morning that I cannot see your heart. There's no way that I can look and know what you're going through, what you've done. I have no idea with any one of you. I have a hard time keeping up with myself. <laughs> and that's the truth. But what he didn't know is that God had already told him what his heart condition was like. And as he gets there, he, he lies. I, I want you to know that he lied. And, and you know how many people would lie and lie and lie until they make themselves believe what they're saying is true? I, I've got family that, that, that are, are today not going to church because, because of a lie they've made up. Because they don't think it's important. And, and, and it's so easy. That's what he did. He lied right to God's man, right to his face. His heart wasn't right in the sight of God. And instead of being honest up front, he come to him and he said, I did all that the Lord called me to do. I performed it just like he said. No, he didn't. He lied. So we see, in, in, he goes on, he says uh, in verse 15, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. So now he's trying to make up why and justify his lie. He's trying to rationalize why it's okay that, that he did it this way instead of the way that God told him to do it. Because, you know, we kept the best for our people. You know, we did this this way because of it. He's rationalizing Adrian, Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite men of God, once said that a lie is like a clock. He said if, it, if, if you was to take, take a clock and you was to take it, if it was off by, by eight or ten hours, he said no one would believe it. But if it was off by five minutes, it'd cause you to lose your plane. Remember when, when, when Adam and Eve was in the garden and, and Eve was tempted of the devil? He didn't come to her and, and present a lie to her that was far from the truth. He brought the truth and just changed one word. That's what lies does to people. And you know what happens when, when our heart isn't right with God? It's so easy to find a place to where we're, we're just rationalizing the truth. We're trying to make up a truth that fits us, and we're not being right with God, not being honest with God. That's what this man did. And I want you to see that. All he was doing was an outward religious performance. And God says, I don't look upon the out, outside of man. See, coming to church and all these things. Let, let's read this scripture and then we'll go on. Verse 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, listen to this, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Question, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken than the fat of rams. Uh, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. You know what rebellion is? In, in the sight of God, it's, it's as witchcraft. There is one thing that God cannot deal with. It's a heart of rebellion and stubbornness. It's a heart that says, I, I, I've got it right, I'm performing, I'm doing it. But the only time that God can really deal with your heart is when you open your heart up to Him and say, look, I can't do it on my own. Without you, I'm nothing. I want to be honest. I want to be right with God, and I want to give my heart Right, and want to make it right with God. That's the only way God can deal with you today is to open your heart to Him. David said in Psalms, he said, search me. Try me. Look, look at my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And this morning it would do us all some good. Every one of us, 
if we just be honest with God, honest with ourselves, open ourselves up to God and say, God, I know you don't look at see as man sees. I realize that you don't look at my performance as a Christian, but you're looking on my heart. You know what's the most important thing about all of this is your motive. God's looking at your motive. God's wondering not what you're doing for Him as Saul thought. It was, look what I did. God don't care about what you do. God cares about why you do what you do. God's looking at your motive. And in the end, the Bible says that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're saved today, one of these days you'll stand before Him. And he, you will give an account for what you did in your body, whether it be good, whether it be bad. And on that day, you know what God's going to judge? He's not going to judge you of your sin. All that was nailed to His cross. It was taken out of the way. Thank God forever. But on that day, He's going he's to judge your motive. He's going to judge not what you did, but He's going to judge why you did what you did. And, and what you did out of a pure motive, I believe with all my heart, on that day it will not be burned up, but it will stand. And you shall receive a reward for that. And I'm looking forward to the day of the Lord. But it's time this morning that we would quit playing games and get our hearts right with God. I, I want to close on this. I had a lot more, but I feel like it, it's time, time to close. In, in verse number 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy words, because I, listen to this, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I just believe that probably what will cause you to not get your heart right with God nine times out of ten is because you're afraid of something. You're afraid of what you're looking at ahead financially. Maybe you're afraid, you know, with, with your work, everything going on, what life is going to be like, uh, uh, in, in your looking future. You're afraid of what people will say, what people will do. If you do that, it will hinder you from getting your heart right with God. The thing to do is not worry about your neighbor, not worry about the future. Realize that all of that's in God's hands, and just put your trust and your hope in Jesus. That's what David did. He defeated a giant. I believe today if we do that, we could defeat giants in our life. We could, we could do that. One of the greatest scriptures that I love the most is whenever Peter was in the boat and Jesus came walking to him on the water. And if you remember... Jesus calls out to Peter and says, Peter, come. Peter never could have walked on the water if he didn't have the Word of God. When the Word of God, when Jesus spoke, come out on this water and walk with me, come, inviting him to come out of that boat, inviting him to step out on that water, when he spoke that that water became concrete. That water was like walking out on that sidewalk outside. And Peter just stepped out of that boat, started taking steps on the water. That, that, that blows my mind. It amazes me to know that at the Word of God that somebody could do something so amazing if they would just put their heart in the right place and believe and trust in Him. And I thought about that man and he's, you know what, you know what happened? What caused him to stumble? What caused him to sink? He started to get afraid because he started to look around. Started to see all the things out there that was uh, contrary with the winds blowing and the seas that were raging, everything going on. He got afraid and he started to sink. Why? Because he took his eyes off Jesus. He took his eyes off the only one that can help him. And Rick Warren, <laughs> Rick Warren, one of the greatest pastors, I, I love that man, wrote the, the, the um, 40 days of purpose, and a purpose-driven life, a purpose-driven church, a wonderful man of God. He said, he said, there, there's two things in life that will, will keep you from living your life for God, keep your heart from being right with God. One of it is envying what everyone else has. It's wanting what everyone else has. I, I, you never have enough. I always want, and then when you get that, guess what? You're going to want more. When you get that, you're going to want more and more, and, and that will keep you from getting your heart right. And the second thing is people pleasing. Always trying to please somebody else. Always wanting everybody to be happy. Guess what? You'll never make everybody happy. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to... But you know what? Just because everybody don't like the way I preach, just because everybody don't like my style, well, God's called me to do something the way that I do it. And I don't care what everybody else says about it. You know why? Because I care about what God says about it. They didn't call me into this thing. God did. I'm not living for an audience 
other than one. And that's what Rick said. He said, if you would learn to live your life for an audience of one, you could do what God's called you to do, and it would be easy. It would be fun. It would be enjoyable. You would, it would be exciting. And, and, and that is the secret, I believe, today to live in. Jesus said that the devil came to kill, and to dis- kill, steal, and to destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You want to live the most abundant, blessed life you'll ever live. Cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for the Word of God. We thank You, Lord, for Your Son Jesus that went to Calvary and paid our sin debt, Father, in full that we would have the right to the tree of life. We thank You, God, for Your precious Word that's concrete. If we put our faith in it, God, we can walk all over it knowing that it won't waver, falter, or fail. And Lord, we we pray, God, this morning for uh, my dad. I pray, God, you would strengthen him and get him back into good health, back into the pulpit. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for this church. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for touching lives here, God, and changing people and the work that this church is doing, Father, for this world that's lost. And I just pray that they continue out of the right heart, Father, out of the right motive, God, to serve you with everything they've got while they can. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this young man of God that has brought us this inspirational message. We pray your blessing upon him. And we pray all who have received it this day that we might go forth and and be the, the persons and the witnesses that you would have us to be in this community. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.